Hi, everyone. My name is Jean Arturi. I'm manager of the Weston Art and Innovation Center. Welcome to Through the Lens of Art and Innovation, Building Bridges with John Schul. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded. Please close your video if you'd rather not be seen. Please keep yourself muted until the discussion opens up at the end. You can post questions in the chat or raise your hand then. Last spring, we hosted a series of talks on how art builds compassion and empathy. This fall, we'll be exploring how innovation can also build compassion and empathy. I'd like to introduce Ian Roy, one of the AIC's board members. Ian is Director of Research Technology and Innovation at Brandeis University, as well as founding head of the Brandeis Maker Labs. Ian. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, and I am here tonight to introduce our esteemed guests, John and Ben. Uh, and I want to start with a brief uh, overview of who they are before they get started. Uh, so John Schull is a biological psychologist, inventor, uh, entrepreneur, human computer interaction researcher, and digital community organizer. John is the creator of Enable and the founder uh, uh, and the co-founder with Marla Parker of the Enable Community Foundation, an open source prosthetics movement. In a past life, uh, John was the founder of softlock.com, aka digitalgoods.com, a seminal digital rights management company. Dr. Scholl is the author of 19 patents and former director of RIT's Center for Innovation. And with him tonight, also from Enable, we have Ben Rubin. And Ben is the current media coordinator for Enable, where he develops media strategies for 180 chapters across 50 plus countries. Uh, ben has an MFA in visual literacy from RIT. And before Enable, Ben had done some amazing international inclusive community development and was faculty at the National Institute for the Deaf in Rochester, New York, and a design lecturer at the London College for Design and Fashion in Hanoi, Vietnam. And we're lucky also to have a Brandeis alumni with us, with us, Liz Washington, who founded the Brandeis Prosthesis Club and recently graduated from prosthetics grad school. John, if you want to take it away. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Tell me you can see my screen. I'll go to full screen. And we're almost there. And I want to be in present mode. So I have to leave full screen for a minute. That'll do. All right. And I assume you do not see this gallery of images on the side of people's faces. All right. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy to be here and happy to be making friends and building a network in Boston uh, where we've got a lot going on. My talk could be very short um, because I. I like to begin with this video. Which, however, is not playing as a video. Interesting. Give me a second here. All well, huh? here we go. This is Shay. Shay was, I think, seven years old at the time. If you look carefully, you can see that on her right hand, she's missing fingers, but she gets to put this hand into a 3D printed plastic prosthetic made by an Enable volunteer. She bends her wrist, she makes a fist, and she smiles. And I like to say that's all we do. We make children smile, we make parents weep, and we make nerds rejoice. And thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Uh, but there's actually a little more to the story. Uh, let's talk about how this all began, if you will. And I'm going to try again to go back into full screen. Having not learned my lesson, I will exit full screen. I will try to go back into presentation mode, which, all right. I'm going to stick with what I got here. Okay, so here's the enable creation myth, which does have the virtue of being true. And around 2014, this carpenter in South Africa 
lost the fingers on his right hand and realized that prosthetics are expensive and awkward. He found this guy, a hobbyist and um, puppet maker named Ivan Owen, who had made a mechanical hand, which he was using for cosplay. And they collaborated across the internet for over a year, eventually going from physical handmade prototypes to 3D printed prototypes. And in 2013, when I saw this movie, I noticed that while most YouTube video comments are the most demoralizing literature um, uh, genre in the history of the world, these were pretty positive. And I put up a post of my own in which I said, and it was entirely untrue at the time, that Enable is a global volunteer assistive technology network built on an infrastructure of information technology, 3D printing, and goodwill. And as you can see, uh, I invited people to put pins on that map. People did begin putting pins on the map. And next thing you know, we were a global community with chapters, among other places, in Thailand, which is where actually Ben and I met each other um, after eight years after having worked together at RIT. And the network has grown, as Ben will be discussing. And that, in 30 seconds, is the entire history of the Enable movement. But we eventually, and not too far along down the road, we realized that while we thought it was all about technology and devices, it was actually not even about what the devices do, it was much more about what the devices seem to mean. And this being a, a talk on uh, art and innovation, I thought I would talk about these devices as products of self-expression um, and as devices of imagination, which is really what the movement has become. This all was unclear to us when we started, but uh, this kid, the one who may have been born without fingers, but with one of the greatest smiles in human history, um, got an enable hand at Christmas. They snapped the picture and he said, look, I got an Iron Man hand. Fox News picks, picked this up, and within weeks, our community was producing Iron Man hands and Captain America hands and Wolverine hands and Spider-Man hands and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle hands. And eventually the whole thing got a little bit out of hand. But we came to realize that the superhero motif, the superhero mythos is really a very big part of what has given enabled that kind of impact. Uh, let's face it, if, if superheroes always have got some sort of tragic flaw and then some bit of magic or a technology or a spider bite or something gives them superpowers that allow them not only to tr transcend um, their, their flaw, but to become heroes and models to the rest of the world. For these kids, for these kids who are getting these mysterious 3D printed devices from a mysterious community on the internet, it's hardly a myth, it's the real deal. This became really clear to us when this kid was interviewed. And just to prove that it's not about the devices, I can tell you that he was being interviewed during a time when the Enable Movement about 2015, when it was so hot, that local news programs were doing stories about kids who were going to get their 3D printed hands and didn't even have one yet. And what Nathan said was, and I'm paraphrasing, but this was what he said. He says, you know, I've got this funny hand and it means it's hard for me to do certain kinds of things. And you know, he said, I have bad dreams. And in these dreams, I've got monsters who come running after me, but now, I just turn to these monsters and I say, you can't scare me because I have two hands. Now this is before he'd even gotten the device, right? So the significance of these devices is doing at least as much as the functionality, the mechanical functionality of the devices. And it's not this kid, this kid, and it's not just boys. This girl is clearly <laughs> living her best life 
um, with several adopted personas um, and is empowered and liberated by her ability to adopt whatever mythical, non-mythical, mechanically augmented identities she wants. The same thing can be true about the little girl on the right, on the left, rather. Um, these devices turn out to be objects for self-expression and for self-definition. And it's not just Western uh, kids. This this is Victoria from Ghana. She was um, in a house fire and lost part of her arm and was somewhat uh, scarred. And when she got her prosthetic hand, she drew a picture describing herself as a super healer. She put on a costume and she began dancing and the picture was captured. There's some video out there on the internet of her sort of dancing and singing, I'm a superhero, I'm a super healer. We find that when we talk to parents about the devices and we say, well, how's it working out? They say, great. If we go so far as to say to American kids, we're the ones who, who I interact with a lot, and how often does the kid wear it? They get a little sheepish and they say, well, not that often, but, and they'll often say, they do wear it the first few days of school because suddenly they're no longer that weird kid with the funny hand. They are the luckiest kid in the class because, well, because they've got a superhero hand. And in the case of Derek, who had an arm that we had built, the RIT arm, he could actually reach things off higher shelves than his classmates. So it really changes things a great deal. But it's not just boys and it's not just girls and it's not just self-expression. The other thing we have realized, and it's taken us a long time to really get this, is that all of the things I've talked about are social phenomena. Um, Victoria also uses her hand to carry her little brother. And uh, you know, I have lots of other cherished pictures of moms carrying their children um, or nursing their children using their prosthetic hand. And this notion of the hand as an important social device is something that has become clearer over time. It was only a few years ago that I was in Honduras and I met this fellow on the right um, and interviewing him. And he was one of two people I met on the same day. You'll, you'll see both of them. Um, they both, by the way, lost their arms because it's a different story in every country. But in Honduras, the two people I met both lost their arms through electrical accidents. One of them, the, both of them lost one above the elbow and one below the elbow. And both of them got one below elbow arm, as you can see. And so I learned all this by talking to him and I, I asked him how often he wears his device. And he said, oh, I wear it every day. That's unusual uh, in my experience. And I uh, said, and what's the most important use you have for your arm? Expecting a functional story. And he looked at me like I was crazy because he'd been holding this little girl's hand for the 10 minutes that we'd been talking. And he said, this is the most important thing I do um, with my arm. And I thought that was really an interesting story. And then a few hours later, I meet the other one, the other guy in Honduras. Um, this is Chris John. He also got an arm. He, like Juan, became unemployable when he lost his arm in Honduras. And like Juan, he established his own business. Juan sells house plants from his home. And Christian operates a little hole in the wall uh, sandal shop in his local village. And I said, this is great. Show us what you do. And he says, he was accommodating. And he took a sandal off, off the wall and he showed me what he does. Uh, and when I asked him, what's the most important use of your arm for you? He said, no. 
when I go to the bar with my friends, I can give them a fist bump. <laughs> so again, this social element, which of course is a part of self-definition and self-expression, turns out to be a really important piece of what we're doing. And it was not at all really what we understood we were doing at the beginning. Christian is also an interesting case to think about because it turned out Christian, he was a welder before he had his accident and he continued to do metal work after he did his accident. And on closer inspection, we realized the arm he was wearing was not the arm we had given him. He had re-engineered his entire arm out of sheet metal and became one of a growing number of enabled volunteers who were applying their own cultural mores and their own skill sets to design and customize their own devices. And we've got a number of cases of this sort. Um, this is Aaron Westbrook, who now has a company and a nonprofit uh, called Form 5 Prosthetics. And I say with some pride and some ambivalence that there's no mention of Enable, but he got involved and he's doing great. He's doing wonderful work. Um, he received an enable hand. He said this when he was in high school. He said, this is great. He started making enable devices. He's now creating 3D printed devices, many of them of enable design for other children. Um, and he, dare I say, dropped out of college and seems to be having a great time doing great work. Um, on the top right, you see Stephen Davies. Stephen Davies is wearing an Enable Phoenix hand, one of our designs, but he's holding an arm that he designed for other people, including this girl who was his first recipient. They call their arm the unlimited, unlimited arm, get it? Unlimited and uh, They've done hundreds of arms in England. And in fact, he had an audience with the Queen recently and she gave him some medal. So they're a very big deal uh, in England. And the unlimited arm designed by a one-armed one designer um, is one of the most popular and because it's easy, easiest to build arms in the world right now, in the world of Enable right now. At the bottom, you see Nate Monroe. Um, Nate lost his arm as an adult, unlike, uh, I think, well, unlike these cases, um, in a motorcycle accident, he could not afford or did not avail himself of medical services. And so his arm ended up being amputated. He did get through some form of insurance, uh, a medical prosthetic, which you see him wearing, but he couldn't play the guitar with it. And frankly, he found it um, heavy and awkward, but he latched onto a navel and he, des he designed the arm at the right, which is a complete modular arm system called the NIOP arm. NIOP stands for NIOP, non-insurance optimized prosthetic for people who don't have insurance. And that arm is, uh, being used now, in this case, in Aleppo, Syria, where an enable chapter under the most you know, mind-bogglingly difficult uh, conditions in, the, in recent years has established a very effective and very innovative um, enable chapter and clinic where they're serving people who are not losing limbs through electrocution, but they're losing limbs through the conflict that is there. Every story is different, every culture is different, but there are some things that sort of stay the same. Um, and I wanna talk about some of the things that have made Enable Enable um, and how we, how we do what we do. So first of all, I just want to review. This at the top left was the original 3D printed uh, hand created by the South African carpenter and the puppet maker. You can see that we've come a long way since then. Um, this is Derek 
with the arm that could reach the higher shelves. And that was produced by my team at RIT when having said, we can make 3D printed prosthetics and inviting people to come visit us. Someone said, great. And we said, well, uh, send us a picture of his hand. And said, well, the point is he doesn't have a hand. So on the fly and improvisationally, we invented an elbow actuated 3D printed arm that used a PVC pipe as the, um, uh, as the forearm. And while we were telling the parents that it was an experiment, we really weren't good at this kind of thing, Derek put the darn thing on. This is the picture that was snapped. And he did this and it was clear that it was a hit even if it didn't work all that well. And it didn't work that badly. Um, so that was hands to arms, but then you can see that we've also made great progress in making the hands more organic looking. And there's been a forking in development in two directions. On the one hand, um, people of my persuasion are always driving for the simplest possible device. And I'm gonna make a plug for that strategy. And so here you see the gripper thumb hand, it has exactly one moving part. It has a spring-loaded thumb, no wrist, no bending, just a spring-loaded thumb, and you can put things into it and it latches on. But it looks pretty good and it functions quite well, actually. And so anyone can make them. And in some parts of the world, including Thailand, they're quite widely used. More recently, um, we added a motor to the gripper thumb hand. And more recently still, um, two groups have worked in the opposite direction, not towards greater and greater simplicity, but towards greater and greater functionality or naturalness. So the Kwawu arm by another volunteer in Colorado is quite a beautiful object. Um, and the kinetic hand done by an Australian, but open source and donated to the enabled community is a spectacularly nice looking hand. And this year, we are working to replace the flexible joints that make the kinetic hand work, um, which are fairly hard to fabricate. And Ian is nodding his head as if he may have had some experience with this. Um, we're working on a system based on another design, the Osprey, in which weed whacker cable or uh, heavy duty nylon fishing line is used to push the fingers open and to pull them so that it will be a very simple and smooth operating device, but it will still have the look of the kinetic hand, um, which is such a beautiful thing that people are picking it up all over the place, but it's really quite a challenge to put together. So these are designs that, that came from every place from South Africa to Australia, Israel, and Syria. We are a global network. And one of the things that tie us together is, I will say, our shared values and our shared designs. Um, you know, art and invention, single inventors or artists, often there, um, I think I have a Michelangelo image at the beginning. He was a collaborator. He had a whole team working on the Sistine, Sistine Chapel. And I have to believe they had significant input into his work. I can tell you that the Michelangelo's in Enable, or the mere mortals in Enable at least, do what they do in collaboration with each other. Improvisation and sharing are really important parts of what we do, as is the value which have become part of the enable culture. Uh, and finally, there is the principle that I say, I like to say, our goal is not to produce a device which is as good as possible, but to produce something that is substantially better than nothing. Because the people we can serve and the people a global network of volunteers can serve are not the people who have access to medical grade prosthetics, particularly people like children who will outgrow medical grade prosthetics or pe people in developing countries who can't get medical grade prosthetics, their alternative is nothing. And in, in particular, since 
we've come to learn that the importance of these devices is as much in the relationships by which they get the device and the relationships that are facilitated by the devices, producing things that are substantially better than nothing, less sophisticated than we might be able to do because we're really smart engineers, and simple and easy for volunteers to produce, is how this stuff has been able to spread around the world. But the other principle, of course, is the principle that is often described as open source, and all of our devices are open source, which is to say um, the designs are made freely available on the internet, as was the very first one, which allowed, it, allowed me to co-opt their little um, project and help turn it into this global movement that sort of ran away on its own. You make the designs available and you encourage people to borrow those designs, to remix them, make new features, to improvise and to share. And by the way, I use these particular images just because that turns out to be um, my story about the Enable logo. This is not the most commonly used Enable logo. and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, I found the image on the top left as clip art and I uh, said, well, I could do something to that. And so I added strengths. And I thought that was nice. It showed sort of helping hands, helping each other. And it um, nonetheless sort of was a reference to the standard cable operated enable hand. Some of our volunteers discovered that this clip art had also been adopted by a funeral home and a public school and a number of other people. Now for me, I think that's great because it's all about remixing and improvising and making it up as you go along. But it's one of our lesser used logos. However, one day I was in the lab and I had a 3D model I had produced and I had a bunch of plaster hands that we had made in order to fit some, um, some people. And I snapped this picture. And to me, this picture sort of captures this aspect of the enable ethos, right? You've got hands supporting a mishmash of well-meaning and useful and meaningful devices captured in a symbol which has spread around the world and then gets transmuted through the various cultures and technologies that pick it up. In some ways then, enable, like art, like culture, like invention, and especially like innovation, which is the spread of invention, which turns out to be the real magic here, is how do you get this up to spread? Enable turned out to be a viral phenomenon, I think, because it happened to be at the convergence of a great many emerging technologies and emerging practices, many of them very much inspired by what the internet made possible. You take pictures of smiling kids with 3D printed devices and you get them on the internet and people find out that they're made by volunteers using 3D printers and the designs are available online and it spreads. And then the question is, and this is where I'm gonna introduce Ben. Once it's spread, how do you organize a global network of volunteers who've basically been infected with a runaway idea? And so now I'm going to put myself on mute. I'm going to stop sharing and All right. Can everybody hear me? Sanat, okay, great. Yes. I'm gonna share my screen. So I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper into organization beyond organizations. I think um, John's point about the, a volunteer community that's decentralized and distributed, um, it's it's like herding, as, as uh, we've, we've talked at times in, in meetings, um, cats and birds at the same time. There's a lot going on, um, keeping up with it. 
is is a full-time project and that's exactly what brought me into enable so i proposed an idea about three years ago to the it's an online community voting platform within enable so by the time that i got involved um, enable had um, adopted lumio as a uh, a website where people could propose ideas and, and if everybody in the community, um, if enough people voted to support it and anybody could vote in the community, um, there was a small central piggy bank for volunteers supported by donors like Comcast, YouTube, and the Dora Foundation, which is a, a national NGO supporting the arts. Um, my project was the media coordination project looking at how basically collaborative reporting could be um, bringing together volunteers and chapters and, and sharing some of the, the stories that were happening because it was going in every direction at once, but um, through a series of newsletters, chapter spotlights, community meetups, and, and some centralized infrastructure like our open source community hub, which is sort of like a Facebook social media space. Um, we've been able to, um, track more of the, the activity and design a sustainable way for continuing um, these kind of collaborations through a, a fellowship program. And I'll get into that at the end. So taking a, a big step back, Enable is not a single organization, which is a pretty unique thing. It's a constellation, uh, a web of interdependent chapters and volunteers, and like a constellation, the way that the different uh, volunteers and chapters line up is dependent on the eye of the beholder. So it's, it's really interesting to see as I've connected with volunteers and chapters in different places, how Enable fits for them and how it's adapted in, in different parts of the world. So for chapters, a chapter can be a nonprofit, but it also can exist within traditional organizations like schools, businesses, government agencies. It's not a requirement, but they can be traditional organizations within traditional structures. We developed a badge system that allowed uh, different people to propose um, a chapter and submit some some proof that they had some skills with 3D printing, um, a Facebook group, there's sort of a set of criteria. Today we have 196 chapters in 53 countries and it's changing all the time. And again, this was with an, a badge, it's an open source badge system called Badger. Um, but it brings together all of these different kinds of chapters. We didn't define it very specifically um, then there's also volunteers that are not affiliated with any specific chapter. So in, in our open source hub, um, we have about 2000, over 2000 volunteers from 101 countries. And some of them are organized with chapters, but most of them aren't. And these are folks that are interested in um, contributing to the effort, um, but sometimes working really successfully by themselves. And again, we have a chapter of a badge for that. So we've been able to track um, some of the activities and collaborations through this, this badging system. It's important to recognize that the chapters and volunteers are financially independent. So again, without a central organization, um, controlling all of the volunteers, each uh, group, each team or individual um, are working independently from the enable um, sort of uh, th their efforts are independent and they're participating um, with shared values. So we have a community values policy that, that aligns um, what fits inside of our this community effort. 
but it, it's not something that can be managed like a traditional organization. So the next question is what holds the community together? So besides values, there's, there's an open source ecosystem which, which works in unique ways. Um, this slide shows the difference between a jellyfish in the water, which has a lot more grace than a jellyfish on the land. And in the same way, supporting our volunteers and chapters involves looking at the, the shared ecosystems that they all benefit from and supporting that. So in that vein, we have centralized resources like the Enable Hub, um, which has lots of general information. There's some open source devices that we list. It's mostly English-based. Then we have decentralized chapters, which involve localized networks, organizational partnerships and policies, resources, all adapted to regional languages and cultures, and again, independently funded. And then we've got distributed volunteers, which form their own connections across organizations and borders and learn new skills, contributing to international projects, ongoing cases, and regional needs. So these are all going on at once. And supporting Enable involves recognizing these, these different ecosystems that are coexisting. On the right is a, is a visualization that, that John actually put together tracking some of the activities and collaborations of community members. And you'll recognize that it really does look a lot like a jellyfish. Um, one of the, the unique characteristics of jellyfish and starfish are that they can be broken into different pieces and they tend to regenerate and and propagate. And in a similar way, the Enable movement, not being a traditional organization, has had this ability to um, adapt in really agile ways and um, to spread in, in a surprisingly um, prolific way. So one of the first efforts, projects that I was interested in was meeting and interviewing specific chapters that were doing really interesting, unique things and trying to get a sense of um, how they had adapted in, in their uh, local regional environments. So today we have 10 chapter spotlights and really each one um, shows a chapter that works in very unique and different ways. It's, it's like, um, tracking jellyfish in the ocean, there's different species that, that start to show um, that are working together in some ways, but also in, in really unique ways, um, developing partnerships with traditional organizations. And I think in a similar way, I think the number of jellyfish in the ocean, you know, maybe scientists have have uh, classified 10% or 5% of jellyfish, but there's, there's a lot more out there. And we've only um, gotten to about 5% um, of the chapters to get these really in-depth interviews. So there's a lot more um, to learn from. And, and each chapter really is, is developing um, you know, year to year. So there's, there's a lot of growth and just getting the tip of the iceberg has been really um, really helpful and interesting. So it's not just chapters and volunteers. There's also other kinds of organizations that have adopted Enable and, and supported its efforts. Um, art installations and museums um, have really been uh, wonderful collaborators. So here we've got the Franklin Institute of Science Museum in Philadelphia um, with their Everyday Engineer exhibit. Um, this, I think, was open just a few weeks ago. On the right is the Bespoke Bodies Traveling Exhibition Program, which also involved a 200-page publication. Um, a really 
phenomenal effort that they did um, at that Naval is a part of. In 2017, we had an installation at the Tate Modern. And in 2019, uh, the Comcast headquarters had their Universal Sphere video installation involved, um, enable uh, showing how the, the movement contributed. And um, that's John in the middle, you can't really tell. <laughs> in terms of education, almost half of our chapters um, come from schools. So we've got 44 official university chapters and 43 high schools and middle school chapters around the world. And as John mentioned, the ability for the Enable movement to be um, an educational opportunity, not just in terms of engineering and STEM, but also about compassion um, and an application of these kinds of technologies has really spoken to a lot of students and teachers, and it, it really defines the next generation of change makers. It, um, I think it's, it's opening up some um, medical um, health care systems in, in unique ways. For example, in Brazil, enable devices are, you need a prescription. So it's, it's integrated into their healthcare system. Um, and I think a big part of the success of some of these regions involves um, developing partnerships with students who graduate and become professionals. There's been some really star players in, in our educational um, community. So Lindsay Wells from the Wappinger School District in New York developed a curriculum, not only across grades and, and districts, but also across continents. Um, I think the ability to share some of these resources is, is a next step for the Enable community. So not just open source devices, but also open source educational materials. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of really exciting contributions in that recently. And to conclude, um, my proposal, my initial, original project involved uh, modeling, not a position, but a, a rolling fellowship. So something that could uh, be sustainable. And this year we had a collaboration with um, Isabella from Brandeis University at the top, Isabella Kaplan, um, who modeled a, a internship with us and, and did some pretty deep digging into how these types of partnerships work in a decentralized distributed movement like this. And um, she also, before she left, developed two other um, internship descriptions, which we filled for the fall. So you'll see Kevin Dardick and Allison Elliott, and both are working with us now from Brandeis University, um, helping us to develop um, more of an onboarding orientation program for our uh, volunteers and also uh, more event planning, which I think is a wonderful transition to pass the mic back to John. Um, and thanks so much for your time. And I'm going to mute, stop my share. Um, and here we are. All right. So, you know, I think one of the things that comes through from Brand's Ben's presentation is that we are a global collection um, or ecosystem of individual chapters, each of whom is dealing, and this is a strength, um, with unique cultural, political, regulatory, um, and technical circumstances. Different chapters deal with that in different ways. Some, as in Brazil, have actually become extensions of the government um, regulated medical system. Um, others have become, uh, like many of the American chapters, uh, primarily educational organizations. We learn a lot from them. Uh, and in each case, 
they determine their own destiny. Now, it turns out that the Western Art Center, right down the hill, as I understand the geography from Brandeis, which has an enabled chapter, um, has a makerspace and is becoming a, uh, an enabled chapter in its own right. So, as I mentioned, it's sort of emerged that between the Western Art Center and Brandeis and Northeastern University and my old friend Jordan Bollock, who may or may not have left the room during this presentation, uh, he's still there. All right, let's hear for Jordan. Um, there are a number of unique players and opportunities, but one of them who we should not neglect is the famous Liz, who is herself a product of Enable and Brandeis, and now prosthetic graduate um, program. And Liz, I think it might be really interesting for you as co-founder of the chapter, and you as someone who's sort of seen Enable from uh, many different perspectives, to tell us a little bit about your experience and maybe what you think um, should happen at on the Brandeis West and Northeastern axis because after your discussion, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Enable chapter specialties. And then I'm gonna invite you all to discuss what you hope to do with your Enable chapter. What are your goals, aspirations, and, uh, and hopes? Because all we do uh, to summarize our methodology is we try to act as uh, facilitators and gardeners for whatever the heck springs up trying to make good use of this. So. Liz, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you see the field now that you're actually a professional in the field who also, however, came up through the ranks of us amateur do-gooders? Yeah, definitely. Hi, guys. Um, so I graduated from 2007. You're on mute. Oh, you're I not am. on mute, but I don't hear you. Do you guys hear me? You can, Jean, you can hear me. I see a thumbs up. I'm sorry, I do hear you. Okay. I'm sorry, John, maybe, John, do you mind? I think you're still sharing your screen. Yes, I am, thank you. Thank you. Good. All right, so we can hear me then. Okay, um, so I graduated from um, Brandeis back in 2017, which I guess means that I know none of the people who are currently in the club because I have aged out of that, I guess. <laughs> But then I went to uh, the University of Washington where I got my master's in prosthetics and orthotics. And since then I've moved to Roanoke, Virginia where I work at Virginia Prosthetics and Orthotics. Um, and I'm in my residency. Uh, Woohoo, so exciting. Um, <laughs> so I've, um, I've definitely seen a big scope of the field. I think when I started uh, the Brandeis Prosthesis Club, I started it with a lot of help from Ian and H and a really large support from the Brandeis 3D Printing Club. Uh, the club in general wasn't necessarily all interested in um, being a part of the prosthesis club, but they were very interested in helping us get, get our feet under us. Um, and you know, in the first, I'd say few months of the club's uh, existence, the 3D Printing Club um, taught us everything we needed to know. They taught us how to troubleshoot and um, how to work all the machinery. They offered us funding before the university offered us funding. Um, so I just wanna, if there's any Brandesians out there, I wanna give a shout out to the 3D Printing Club and make sure that we're still, you know, great partnerships there. Um, they definitely helped us a lot out. Um, and then it's funny, I think I hit this, since I was kind of at the beginning of the club's existence. I was mostly the paperwork person. I was, you know, applying for the, uh, the badges, I guess, perhaps. I don't remember. I remember I was sending in um, things we'd made to try to get approval for us to, I guess, be a hub, perhaps. I don't remember. There was some approval process I was trying to go through. I don't remember what it was. And then with the university, I was trying to. Anyways, um, I do think it's kind of funny because I was mostly doing paperwork and troubleshooting, um, 3D printing. And I do feel like my job right now as a clinician is mostly doing paperwork and troubleshooting issues. So it did actually really help me out. Um, 
I think my interest in Enable was born from like a, a big interest in new technology and also in clinical care. I think Enable does a really good job of um, allowing accessibility in healthcare, um, specifically in upper limb. I think it's notable that upper limb is the smallest percentage of amputees uh, with lower limb being 80% of amputees and upper limb being a good 20%. And from there also the people who have um, a wrist intact is even, any who are looking for a prosthesis who have a wrist intact is even smaller. So for medical prosthetics and for insurances to focus on all of this patient population, it's just not, um, it's very difficult to find the scope of practice to find a clinician who has the knowledge base and enough patients to specialize in this. So I think, you know, Enable does a really good job of filling that gap of care where um, we try to help where we can, but um, there's a lot of patients, the insurance isn't gonna cover their prosthetic and we don't have the knowledge base to help them out um, because we don't have that patient population often. Um, uh, I do think that uh, health insurance is also something that uh, is really a big talk in upper limb um, and with, with Enable being able to help, especially children receive prosthetic care, that has been really great. And I think uh, before this um, call started, uh, Mr. Scholl asked me about um, how uh, prosthetic and orthotic clinicians viewed Enable. And I would say that the only times I've ever heard it spoken of are when a clinician is trying to get a child uh, insurance approval for a device. They often say, if you get something and you can prove that you can use, you would use a device. If we got you this, you would use it. And then we can send in our paperwork and say, look, they used the enable device, they're using it. Um, then we have a better chance of being able to get them care for the rest of their life in prosthetics. And that in itself is worth, worth anything, right? Um, so I think that has been a really big use of Enable in our career um, in general. We, we love that. Um, uh, I also do think there's this big gap between technology coming out and it being able to be integrated into this field and Enable doesn't have that same gap, right? Like something is invented and you're straight up able to use it because we're dealing with approval from the government, approval from insurance, approval from uh, some regulations. We have this like big red tape that Enable has somehow skirted in the United States. And now you guys can do things that we're just not allowed to do yet. So that has been really cool to see too, just some of the things you guys have come up with. Um, a lot of them, you know, are kind of dupes off of other things we you see in medical prosthetics. It's like, it's also something that exists in medical prosthetics, but it's kind of changed a little bit and duped. So that's really uh, an interesting uh, connection between the two fields. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I really, I do think Enable uh, has taught me a lot about technology um, and made me really passionate about prosthetics and, and um, orthotics also too. Um, I know we didn't talk much about orthotics, but I think orthotics has a similar um, spot where it can be helped by um, large communities um, innovating. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for talking, super interesting talk. And if anyone, if you guys ever want to talk to someone who maybe has a little bit of a different background in medical prosthetics specifically, I'd love to help out where I can. Um, I would say in upper limb, the most common mechanical device uh, opens and closes from scapular abduction like this. And it's because people can't see you do it. If you like bend your wrist, people can see it. If you bend your elbow, people can see it, but like you can hide this. So that's one of the, the things that I was thinking might be a cool um, move to make in um, enables is maybe making some sort of harness that has the ability to do that. So they can kind of hide the, the flexion of the fingers um, and make it more of a seamless, seamless Absolutely. task. You know, it's yeah. interesting you say that we, the RIT arm and several others have the option of being used with a scapular harness, and we, we have done that. Um, in some ways for kids, the notion, that, and we, I, I visited one of our recipients in her uh, first grade class. Uh, she was actually playing, doing the cup 
juggling thing that kids in school do, the dicks. And the, the kids all said, she's really good at it. So that was very exciting. But the other thing I saw when we were in the class was that she was popping her arm on and off. You know, she'd raise her hand and then she'd take off her arm and she'd do some work and then she'd, she'd, she'd do something. A very untypical pattern of use because it was lightweight, it was plastic, and it was only loosely coupled to her, to her arm. So we find that kids in particular don't particularly want the whole harness and they don't care about the functionality that much. It's just, it's just a cool thing. And I think it, it helps them reframe their condition. I did also want to, first of all, your story about um, early adoption of an enabled device helping prosthetists get insurance coverage is a whole new story to me and really, really interesting. So thank you for sharing. I think we're going to follow up with you just to sort of understand that better because our relationship to the professional prosthetic community, let alone the um, regulatory framework is quite complex and I think it's up for re-examination. The Food and Drug Administration, which regulates this kind of thing, um, in fact, was quite sympathetic to what we were doing, but they also helpfully gave us some interesting constraints. They said, as long as you only work on upper limb, as long as the devices aren't motorized, and as long as you don't charge for them, we're putting you in a discretionary category and you don't have to report anything to us, which was hugely liberating. And in some ways, it's those features, and especially the one which says we give it away for free as an experimental device. Um, and we are even careful about calling it a prosthetic at some point, because we don't want to have people think that it's a medical grade, medical grade device, has allowed us to do things that, as you have reaffirmed, established institutions can't do as rapidly and as agilely as we do. Of course, we have less impact and we have lower budgets, but in some ways, I think that is the great opportunity for a global network of volunteers, is that because we're not a classical organization, we can do things and go places and help people that classical organizations fail to help. Um, you know, I like to say that civilization rests on the foundations of institutions, but they're not perfect. And where they don't cover, that's where you find the people we call disabled. The disability is actually an interaction between the individual and the social network. And it's precisely in those gaps that a non-organization has a chance of reaching people who are otherwise not reached. So thanks, Liz. It's a pleasure to meet you. And listen, in a few years, you're going to be a senior, you're going to age out of an internship. You're going to be a senior member of the prosthetic community. And when you get there, we're going to be ready to say, Liz, it's time for you to help us have a real collaboration with the prosthetists who, pardon the expression, have in some ways been holding us at arm's length. Ha ha. Um, because obviously we're we're amateurs operating in areas that they themselves don't typically operate in. So uh, before I open it to questions and discussions, I did want to point out that there is work on lower limbs in the enabled community in both Paraguay and Aleppo, Syria. And enabled chapters have developed some inexpensive 3D printed or partly 3D printed um, devices that are doing people good. I've already explained why that's not a big feature of the American Enable Group, but after Liz reforms um, her guild, we'll be able to do that here as well. Um, other chapters have specialized, and this is a new area of growth for Enable. We've, in the United States, and in much of the Western world, actually, um, it turns out we have so many people who've volunteered to make devices that we don't have enough people asking for devices. And so we've got all these people who say, I've learned how to do it. I want to help. I want to do good with my 3D printer. And it turns out there are lots of animals um, in those same societies who would benefit from 3D printed prosthetics. Now I'm a little concerned that we're going to start 
slapping devices on animals who are perfectly happy running around on three legs. But we are beginning, and I actually suspect that we're going to um, about we're, we're about to begin a new revolution in animal prosthetics because we have hundreds, if not thousands, of people who are going to be figuring out new ways and inexpensive ways of doing this kind of thing. But those are just two examples of different uh, specialties that various chapters have taken on. So now it'd be a good time for you to ask the questions we've kept you from asking and for you to also offer answers to the question I have for you. What does the Western Art Center or the Brandeis uh, Prosthesis Club or the Boston Nexus of enable activity want to be when it grows up? Where, where are we trying to help you get? Thank you, John. And anyone can put their hand up, uh, type a question in the chat, or just unmute yourself if you're comfortable with talking. And I'm going to try. Am I showing my screen? Yes. And I guess while people are thinking of questions, I've got one to sort of kick us off. Uh, what do you think of all of the open source PPE hardware being manufactured in the last two years and that movement and how that relates to this movement? Well, may I say this movement is part of that movement. Like everybody else this year, um, many groups, including uh, one here in, in Rochester, produced literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of PPE. And in Able Chapter, uh, one of uh, ben has written this up in detail, but an able chapter in Lithuania was the major supplier for all of the hospitals in the country of uh, face shields. In Brazil, they produced hundreds of thousands of face shields. Um, our group, by the way, has produced, and I should have one here, of course, but if you go to beclearmask.org, you will see that we've created a clear face shield optimized for public speakers, and people who rely on lip reading. And since you've asked, I think that the COVID crisis is the one that really got everyone really realizing that this latent network of makers and volunteers are a safety net for really all of society and civilization and that they are especially valuable when everything goes to pot, which is of course what happened this year. And they rose to the occasion. And I think even the medical establishment who was literally calling us up saying, hey, can you help? We need, we need face masks, has come to recognize that it's probably a good idea to make sure that that um, backup system is alive and well to fill the gaps. Ben wants to say something about that. All right. Um, yeah, the, the really interesting thing that came out of the, the pandemic in terms of the Enable community was a, a really quick pivot um, to you know, needed um, adapters for equipment and face shields and face masks. But it also, the network itself, as it existed before, um, allowed some teams to collaborate really quickly. These are slides from a different presentation, but um, the collaboration between the Lithuanian chapter and the chapter in Brazil um, involved mapping. So um, Masvi, who's on the left, had made the open source map for the Enable community, which shows her chapters. I shared that in my slide. Um, but he was asked by the chapter leader of Brazil to make a map so they could be collecting who needs this equipment and how can we organize and distribute it. He also ended up making one for Lithuania and in the end was the major contributor for the national face shields. The, the national hospitals um, all mostly got face shields from his efforts. It was over 15,000 devices, um, 300 volunteers. So it's, it's the community um, that, that really uh, can be adapted in a lot of different ways. I just wanted to share that. Um, uh, interestingly, in Lithuania, 
they were able to, no money was exchanged. And Masby reports that the only reason they were able to do it is because the hospitals could not request, would not request the devices, but the individual department heads and surgeons and frontline workers would get in touch with Masby and then they would meet on some road and he would hand off the mask and they would go back. And that's how it happened. Um, you know, I, I think that a, a good part of history in the last few years has been the, recogni the recognition that our social systems, you know, work all that well. The planet is going to hell. Um, everyone knows that climate change is a problem and they're not doing much about it. COVID is a, is a mess and partly because of political and social and organizational uh, practices and constraints that no one knows or is willing to fix. In that situation, global networks of careful, well-meaning, well-educated, or at any rate, um, very competent individuals trying to help others and using the amazing emergent technologies that happen to be available is I think a really valuable um, pillar of society. And I'm hoping that the COVID years uh, are going to be the moment when we get a seat at that table, at that rapidly deteriorating table. I know Weston is planning to hold their first Enable chapter meeting this Sunday. All right. If anyone on the call wants to attend. Yes. And uh, Jean was working on printing some hands for that. Yes, I, um, our first meeting is Sunday afternoon. And to tie in with what John was saying about this community, you see, um, I think, adult groups that have formed, and then you have groups that have formed that are associated with educational institutions like Brandeis or high schools or middle schools, we're sort of unique in that we're, we're an art and innovation center. We're open to anyone from any community as well as students from any schools. Um, if you can get to the AIC on Sunday afternoons, come join us. And I do see someone um, on the call who is going to be helping. He's from Lincoln, Tim, and he um, has helped build enable devices um, with a group in Lincoln and happened to stop by the AIC over the summer and introduced himself and we started talking and he graciously offered, um, no pun intended, to give me a hand. Um, though I've helped assemble one of the hands, um, I'm definitely not an expert and um, we'll be looking to Tim and his team to help out. So thank you, Tim, thanks for being here. That's great. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what you have with your makerspace and what you've done with it, if anything, so far, and where you hope to go with it. The Art and Innovation Center in general? Yeah, well, you have a makerspace at the Art and Innovation Center, right? Yes, we have two makerspaces. We have two mm -hmm. studios. Um, our upstairs studio is sort of our dry makerspace. The cleaner projects happen there. We have um, three... 3D printers that use filaments, and we have one form labs printer that's a resin 3D printer. We also have two vinyl cutters, Cricut makers. We have sewing machines, so people can come take. That's great. What's that? You've got the works. That's terrific. We do, and we are open to anyone. So we offer classes. We have great teachers. We also have um, open studio hours called Maker Lab hours, where people can come and use that equipment if they've demonstrated proficiency. They're welcome to come um, hang out in the makerspace and, and make and play and build. Um, we can, in our downstairs makerspace, it's our wet makerspace. We have dirtier projects down there, painting, um, painting classes. We have a printing press downstairs. We're getting a laser cutter. And again, offering classes and also the opportunity for people to come in independently and use the equipment. Really terrific. I want to be you when I grow up. I'm actually <laughs> looking, I'm looking for a, a, a site here in Rochester for 
a fab lab makerspace collaboratorium kind of thing in order to do this this kind of thing the rochester enables lab was first at rit then we uh were working in a a local charter school for inner city youth um and now we're sort of with COVID, we're sort of wondering what's next. And I'm beginning to think that something like what you've got might be what's next. I think that's really, really great and really valuable. Yeah, it's really exciting. And there's really nothing better than having, you know, people walk in the door and their eyes go wide and, you know, the wheels start turning once they realize everything they can be doing. And also the idea of bringing people from different disciplines together and having them bounce ideas off each other and see, you know, what what new thing they can come up with together. Fantastic. And I would say that even though Brandeis is only 10 minutes away, we're super excited for some of the new things this space could unlock for us, uh, including being able to fly drones. We can't, we have a drone ban on campus. We can't do that recreationally. Uh, being able to have public parking and be a site on a map that the public can come to because right. we're a private campus, we don't have the parking infrastructure. Uh, so we'd definitely be interested in having our groups find that public access and the things that we can do. That's great. Very exciting. Uh, so I, it, might, it might be really interesting to have some of the Enable Club meetings at the Western Arts Center, both because that's how the ideas um, cross-pollinate, um, and because it's good for the students to get off the damn campus once in a while. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I have a question to Liz and John um, Mix. So if you could, um, a lot of the times when we're seeing people start making, building the hands, they, they just, you know, print the pieces and put it together. Um, how would you, looking back, Liz, as a student, how would you, um, you know, encourage uh, experimentation? Uh, and John, also with you, like, how do you, um, what type of activities or talks should we give to our students so they start thinking about it in a way that they can improve on it rather than just build these hands and uh, send it over? That's a great question, uh, which I will be happy to respond to unless Liz wants to go first. I'll say something really quick. Um, and that would be that 90% of my clinical practice is follow-up appointments. And I think that follow-up is something that's possibly missed in this. Um, yes. And following up with those patients, seeing where it broke, and then solving that problem instead of solving a problem that you have created in your head, perhaps, um, might be a good place to start innovating. So that, that, that's like what I was going to say, only better. Um, <laughs> the real way to find a good problem is to put your device to use with a real recipient or to, to see how it fails to solve the actual problem suddenly your attention is focused not on the thing that's coolest but the thing that most needs fixing and often that turns out to be the thing that's coolest but it wasn't obvious until it until it broke um now i don't know how you all are doing in terms of actually finding access to um people who want the devices it's a very rewarding process but it's um in in many cases it's not that easy to find someone who's in need of a device. Now that is partly because we have not been good at systematic outreach or building alliances with the prosthetists who could make referrals with us. Um, that, by the way, might be, might be another conversation worth having later. But if you don't have um, those recipients, we do have a matching system and there are remote recipients available and with a a um, uh, fairly wealthy community like yours, you might be able to work with foreign recipients of whom there are a great number, even though these devices are cheap to make, they're still expensive to ship. But if you're willing to pay expenses, then there are lots of people you can get in touch with. Um, but of course, there are other ways to go into this, the simplification of an existing enabled device or the demonstration of how an existing enabled device fails are all really good observations and really good things that your groups can do in order to find areas for innovation and improvement. Also, the Enable Hub 
is full of people who are either complaining about things that they wish were better or who are saying, couldn't we do something like this? It's you know, part of the magic that I was talking about is that we've tried to create a culture in which people are comfortable asking what they always call dumb questions, which of course rarely are dumb questions. And all sorts of other people, including people who say this may be a dumb answer, are very happy to, to share with them what they know. And so there are lots of opportunities for collaborating and getting ideas for what needs work um, from the enabled community. Go to hub.e-nable.org, introduce yourself, and feel free to say, there it is, feel free to say, um, I'm a student at Brandeis University. I don't just want to learn how to make devices. I want to do something useful and I want to do something creative. Does anyone have a good idea for me? People will embrace that kind of an observation and they'll probably have some good suggestions. I'm waiting for probably questions. have time for two more questions if anyone has something. <laughs> That's okay. When are you going to come visit Boston? <laughs> as soon as I get a damn invitation. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm ready. I'm ready. Um, and, and I'm eager. I'd really like to get together with uh, the Boston Enable Network and think about what's coming next. As a matter of fact, one of the things that may come next, and Brandeis intern Allison Elliot is looking into it, um, is a conference on Enable in Education or some other kind of regional conference that might take advantage of the fact that you all are sitting at the you know, uh, education and, and intellectual capital of, uh, of North America, I think it's fair to say. Um, and so that would also be something worth talking about, but I also like to, um, to see what else is going on. So I'm, I'm available anytime and would we'll look forward to that. I guess two other little threads that I'd love to pull on is that OER topic that Ben was talking about. I think the OER possibilities are huge. Open educational resources, open yes. source. Uh, and uh, we haven't mentioned, we talked a bunch about 3D printing, but we haven't really talked about 3D scanning. And I know that originally your fittage was based on a couple small measurements, but we can do so much more measuring now with like low cost technologies. Well, this is, beginning to, this is beginning to sound like the Brandeis superpower, because those are both um, really good, good possibilities. We absolutely are, we have lots and lots of open educational resources, um, but we don't have a curator and we don't have someone who is devoting time to put them together. We've actually got a really nice template and lots of material. So if that's of interest, I'd love to see you do more of it. And uh, we'd love to work with you on that. As far as scanning goes, um, it's, a, it's a continual interest, but you know, like a lot, of, a lot of other people, I just got an iPhone 12 and it has a pretty good scanner, I hear, but I haven't figured out how to use it yet. So I think we may just be entering into the moment when we can work out processes. Um, and in fact, it occurs to me as we speak, that there are probably enable volunteers all over with iPhone 12s, one in a city near you. And so that might be a really interesting way of creating a workflow so that recipients who don't want to go through the measurements and don't want to, they can simply say, find a recruiter, an enable recruiter near you. They'll explain the process, they'll scan your device, and they'll help you find a maker anywhere in the country who can help you do it. So those are three good ideas, Ian, thank you very much. And indeed, customization is, um, is of course critical. You know, I should say, um, I just want to acknowledge that the work that processes do 
is really radically different from the work that Enable does. We make devices and we, we provide this sort of social support network. Prosthetists fit the devices and attend to the health and well being of the patient in a way that we are not qualified to do. They also systematically follow up, which we frankly are qualified to do, but damn it, the volunteers don't seem to be particularly eager to do. And so um, there's a lot of room for improvement there also, as well as partnership. I guess, Liz, with your background, how much of this do you find is science and engineering and how much of this is an art and more of a social con like construct like John was talking about? Yeah, it's a lot of both. I think um, I actually, I don't, I think I mentioned this, but I did get a sculpture degree as well from Brandeis. That was one of my degrees. So I am a little bit of the mix between both a science and an art, but um, I think you will ask uh, one prosthetist, like there's one prosthetist in my, who I work with who does everything uh, by measurements. He has an ex crazy Excel sheet with 4% reductions and like insane. And then another man who just walks in and does everything. He scans something and then he does everything online and he's just kind of like, a, like an art. He's like, it works. Um, so I think even in like a more medical based community, it's somewhere in between. Um, and I think it, it attracts both types. I would say the type it is currently attracting tends to be more technical than the, tra the, the type it used to attract, which, um, I think is part of might be part of the issue you're having in the field as well would be the older people in the field are more uh, artistic and a little free with their <laughs> their their, uh, their work um, and I think the younger generation has a lot of engineers who got excited uh, and yeah that's that's the mix interesting um, make sure the engineers maintain the spirit of innovation um, one of the interesting things about Enable is that because there's no one preventing us, we've been able to invent and in many cases reinvent things relatively quickly. Um, it's not clear to me that except at the very high end of prosthetics that that kind of ongoing innovation um, is that common. Uh, they, my impression is that prosthetists are taught how to do things the right way. Um, and that the occupational therapists often are the ones who say, okay, now that you've got the right device, just right for you, then they roll up their sleeves and say, let's actually figure out what you're trying to do and help you do it. Um, and so there, there's a role for all of those attitudes, but I, I'm not convinced that separation, separating the specialists is that good a way of producing an integrated solution. I don't think healthcare makes good solutions for integrating specialists. So I would agree with you there. All right, well, we're counting on you. When you're running the place, we're gonna set it right. We'll try. All right. Well, I think that was two questions and it's 8.30. So I still haven't gotten my invitation, but I look forward to seeing you again and, and, and enjoyed talking to you. You are welcome anytime, but we yes. got to figure out a reason and a time to come visit Weston, to come visit Brandeis, Northeastern, check everything out. Great. You have a standing invitation. Well, thank you. All right. I'll, I'll avail myself of that. Thank you so much. And My thank pleasure. you, Ben. It was thank you, John. Thank you, Ben, thank you. for your expertise and time. And Liz, so nice to connect and have you here tonight. Yes, thank you, Liz. And Liz, stay in touch, please. Yeah, and Jean, sure. I sent my email in the chat. I, got I also it. want to thank Jean and Audrey from the Weston AIC for helping organize all this and making it possible. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Bye. Have a nice good night, everyone.